y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, we're celebrating mothers and motherhood. In this special episode, we're taking a look back at some of the gems our guests dropped in this inaugural season of Trials to Triumphs. I've been so blessed to be surrounded by mothers who have taught me so much. Whether it's lessons from my sister, Nakina, from my closest girlfriends, or my own mother, I'm always learning from the women who have gone before me. This has been especially true as I wrap my head around what motherhood might look like for me. Today, we're taking a look at how motherhood has not only been a way for my guests to nurture and mold their little ones, but how becoming a mom also shaped their lives. We'll hear how actress Asia Naomi King's son has taught her the power of letting go. If there is a word, surrender is the word. He has taught me, mommy, you're not in control of nothing. So just, <laughs> just go on with it. How teaching her son about forgiveness is challenging Grammy Award winner Kelly Rowland to grow. You have to be honest with yourself when you look in the mirror and have the humility enough to say, I could have made a better decision. How do I make it better? That's it. We'll also hear from acclaimed actress Sonequa Martin-Green, whose children helped heal her during one of the most devastating events in her life. Just being able to dive into them, it's not just salve to the wound. It's like an invitation to keep living, right? They don't even realize what they're doing for you just by their presence, just by how sensational they are. As I begin to think about what my own motherhood journey might look like, I've come to understand that motherhood is a path riddled with its own trials and triumphs, and that sometimes it requires embracing both grief and grace. And in our Sankofa moment, I'm sharing a famous mama whose sacrifice solidified a legacy. Stay tuned for that. Motherhood has been a daily teacher to my friend, how to get away with murder actress, Asia Naomi King. Before she became a mother to her son, Asia suffered two devastating miscarriages. Her experience challenged everything she knew about herself and what lay within her control. It brought her to a place of deep surrender. Now, years later, she looks back on that journey and has become so aware of how her challenges have changed her for the better. At one point in her life, she found herself being so closed off and quiet about the trial she endured. But later on, Asia learned to let go of control and found the strength to tell her story transparently and is now encouraging me and so many others to do the same. it's so interesting that you're talking about a time in your life, which wasn't that long ago, when you were kind of closed off. You were secret. Yes. You were private. You didn't want to share things with others in hopes that it could change whatever the outcome that we don't even know what it is, what it could be, right? Mm -hmm. But in recent years, we've seen you be so transparent about your motherhood journey, about your son, about your husband. And what it took to get to where you are now. Yes. And so what I want to know is after the miscarriages, Mm -hmm. how did you keep going? What was that journey like for you? And what advice would you give to women on the pursuit of motherhood? I love that you call it the pursuit of motherhood. I think that's so beautiful. And the first thing I will say to that is that there are so many ways to become a mother. Mm-hmm. There is no one way to do this. There is no one more natural way than another to do this. Like all the roads to motherhood are real, are genuine. You can believe in them. It doesn't have to be this this idea that I know I thought it was supposed to be. Okay, you fall in love, get married, and then magically have a baby and it all works out and there's never any heartbreak or, <laughs> you know, <Ditto. laughs> boom, done. And that just wasn't the case. And that first miscarriage, I was working on murder. I thought I was going to have a baby. I was so excited. And then I had my first miscarriage and 
it was devastating. And that was one of those times where that eternal optimism really kind of hurt. It, I should say it hurt and it helped because I knew I wasn't going to give up on trying to find a, have, find a baby, (laughs) give up on trying to have a baby. But it was, it was hard for me to go through that loss and to accept that I really had a miscarriage. And I remember because I had to have a DNC because I had to remove some cells in my body. And I still remember it's a procedure where they have to put you under for a little bit. And it's super quick. It's like 20 minutes, you know. But I remember afterwards, as I'm coming out of sedation, looking at the nurse and being like, show me, show me what you took out. I'm like, prove to me that you were right. I'm so worried that I'm going to see like a baby, like mm. that that they messed up and took out my baby by accident. You know, yeah. that was in my like coming out of this sedated state. I'm still like, no, you're wrong. There's a baby in here. I had the positive pregnancy test. It was really hard to to let go because I was so open with my close friends and family, they were able to give me the support that I needed. And I knew, I I knew like, I'm going to have a baby. I don't know how I'm going Mm. to have a baby, but I'm going to have a baby. And I had to start thinking about what are the other ways that might happen or what are the other ways that might look like and how much time do I want to spend trying to have a baby, like just just figuring out all the logistics, having to think about this in a way I never wanted to have to think about it, but had to think about it if I really wanted to be a mother. So then after the second miscarriage, which then I just was like, this can't be happening again. How is this possible? Um, I got really determined. And I was like, okay, you can't just keep doing the same things and expecting a different outcome. We started going to a naturopathic doctor to like, just take a look at my hormones Mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And had I tested in other ways, like we would have gone further. I I would have looked into IVF. I would have looked into adoption. I would have looked into fostering. Like I have relatives who foster kids, you know, and they have a beautiful family. So I would have looked into all that other stuff. But I felt so, so lucky that there just were those like few adjustments with like progesterone and, and my hormones that needed to like we just had to like play around with the numbers to get it to really optimal certain dietary things. Yeah. And it was like, okay, this is going to take some work, but it's the work that you want to do. It's funny because I even struggle with this because I'm always like, yes, what happened to me felt really horrible, but it wasn't as bad as what happened to some other people. And then I have to remind myself, but it's not a competition. So mm-hmm. it's okay to be honest about the fact yeah. that like it sucked. I wanted it to be easier and it wasn't. And it wasn't as hard as for some people, thank God. And I, and because of that, I feel lucky because now I do have my little boy and he's here and he's healthy and I'm healthy. So thank God that friend years ago had that conversation with me about mm. letting people in and being vulnerable and letting go. Because if I was that same secretive, hold on to everything because I don't want to let people in, that would have been so much harder to process alone. And I think so often when it comes to miscarriage, because it's not super openly talked about, we don't realize just how common oh, yeah. it really is. Oh, yeah. yeah. It empowered me in such a beautiful way to be able to hear other people talking about, oh, yes, that is a common occurrence. And I was like, mm. oh, so, okay, I'm not bad. I didn't do something wrong. Yeah. I didn't hurt what should have been my my first two babies you know it's Mm. yeah it was it helped a lot emotionally again I just have to acknowledge you for your transparency I'm in my pursuit of motherhood my husband and I are in our pursuit of motherhood and fatherhood and parenthood (laughs) and uh, it's just so the pursuit of family is not something you really think about when you're younger well some people do but I I wasn't thinking about it but when you're in it You don't realize how much the stories of your community, of the people around you, really help you understand, to your point, you're not alone. Yes. 
there's somebody in your orbit that has gone through the same thing you're going through, is going through the same thing you're going through, is also trying to build their family in whatever way works for them. So I just so appreciate your share because it just really means a lot to me personally. Um, So you talked a lot about conquering your self-doubt. You've been really open about that too. And so I want to hear about how having your son has helped Mm. you trust yourself more. Mm. Yes. I don't want to talk about the doubt. I want to talk about the trust. Yes. Yes. No. And there, there is, I mean, if there is a word, surrender is the word. Like he has taught me, mommy, you're not in control of nothing. So just, (laughs) just go on with it. And there is something really empowering about that because instead of living in this fear of, oh my God, am I doing everything wrong? It's instead been like, oh, okay, we're figuring this out together, which is really incredible. And it's like, yeah, maybe one day you're going to get down for a nap in 20 minutes and maybe the next day is going to take you an hour. <laughs> Okay, that's just where where we are. There is something so beautiful about accepting where we are. This is where we are right now. This is going to be our process and it is unique to us. And I really love that. It makes me feel like I'm super mom, you know? And there there are times that I got to get in my car and tell my husband, like, I'm going to Target to have some alone time. (laughs) And and it's like, all right, you know? It's like deepening that understanding of what you need, what your partner needs, what your child needs, and living inside of that and trusting that. and, and And like, everything is okay. While Asia's story has been marked by grief, learning to be vulnerable and letting people in created the space to let the difficult things out. Her son has also, in the most beautiful way, trained her to accept each stage of her growth. The process of mothering has granted Asia the grace to take a step back and give herself space to grow. It has also provided the freedom to heal emotionally and spiritually within the safety of her community. This was true for actress Soniqua Martin-Green as well. Motherhood has taught her that it's not always about meeting the needs of your children. Sometimes God orchestrates moments when children help meet the needs of their mothers as well. So I I don't have children yet. I I want to be a mom Mm. one day. Uh, But something that I'm curious about is how did you mother? Mm. How did you continue to mother through this? How are you mothering and wifing? Through it, yeah. Like that, I have got to know Uh what is going on, sis. How are you managing? Um, You know, I something that has been very hard, but also very beautiful, is Mm. finding my parents and my children. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, And thankfully, that happens a lot, almost daily, you know, because DNA, blood, roots. Mm. I I feel a little bit like Encanto, uh, the song, Surface Pressure. I felt like 2021 was very much that, where it was just like, Pile it on, pile it on, pile it on. Watch as she buckles and bends, but but doesn't break, right? Although I do feel like I broke, um, I have to say. You know, I was also leading the show too at, at the at the same time because yes, I left. Which we got to get into. Yeah, I left to go take care of daddy um, <sighs> and spend a week with him. And then it ended up being a two-week trip because of everything that happened and because of the, you know, the homegoing services and everything. And then I just went right back to work to finish season four. And I take my leadership role really seriously on that show. So it was, it was a lot. And I could honestly say, looking back on it now, that a lot of that was a blur, but I needed it to, I needed it as a distraction. And so the Lord orchestrated it happening that way. And I'm grateful to him for it because I needed the distraction. 
And so I say that leading into the joy of my children and the joy of my husband, because they are such places of refuge and escape Mm -hmm. and joy. Amen. Amen. And if I didn't have them to mother, it would have been a very different situation. And I know that. And and that's, that's, that's the reality for me. But man, just being able to dive into them, you know, it's not just salve to the wound. It's like, um, it's like an invitation to keep living, right? And it's an invitation wow. to, it's like, hey, I'm a source. I can be a source of, 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 of joy for you and you need it right now. And, and they give it, they don't even realize what they're doing mm-hmm. for you just by their presence, just by how sensational they are. They just lift me out of it uh, so often. So, I mean, there were certainly times, I mean, I had to have the conversation with my son, like, you know, if you see mommy crying or if you, if mommy seems different, if I seem, if I just don't seem normal, just understand that mommy's very sad and dealing with losing, you know, Nona and Papa, that's what, uh, that's what he called them. But I just, I feel like I'm cheating, to be honest with you. How so? It feels like because they give me so much joy, because it's like, man, I am so lifted by my family. And I know that that's not the case uh, for everybody. That's what I love about God. I love the intentionality. Yeah. It is intentional that Kenrick has been your husband. Right. That was intentional. Absolutely. That was intentional. I think we always think that we have so much to do with it. Right. We chose him. He chose yeah. us. Kind of not really. That's we right. We just had to listen to the call. That's right. right. <laughs> oh, yes. We just had so to listen. True. That's so true. That's you so just got to be tapped in. That's so true. It's overwhelming. Mm. It's like it's like it's too much to comprehend fully. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, but everything ends up being an invitation to keep living. Mm. When I started on Walking Dead, that was such a grueling show. And I mean, what a blessing and honor to have been a part of it for the five and a half or five years that I was there. And also what a blessing to be in New York City for the five and a half years I was there, because that also was grueling Mm. and taught me a lot. But it really wasn't until Star Trek Discovery, when I was working 75 to 80 hours a week and was a new mother and, um, and obviously, you know, having to be do my best at being a good wife. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, while he's doing his best to be a good husband. And it's like, I was so overwhelmed. (sighs) There were many days in my trailer where I was like, so this is impossible. My son is, you know, two and cries when I leave. I don't see him. Mm. Mm. You know, I i mean, I see him here and there, but most of the time I am away from him and I'm away from my husband and I come home and either I work on tomorrow's yep. work or I spend some time with my husband. Either I, I get home and I'm able to get my son, I'm able to give him a bath and then like spend time with my husband, but now guess what? I'm going to go to work tomorrow and I'm not fully ready with this particular scene. I'm also in every scene for the most part. So it's like, so when am I living? When am I able to live my actual life? I don't understand. So how do I prioritize this? This is impossible. I remember hearing a word that was, um, and it, w- and it ended up changing my life. But I heard it right in this time. But it was uh, harvest time is the hardest Ooh. time. Because all those crops have to be picked before they spoil. And that's when you're up all night. That's when you're working your fingers to the bone. That's when you're grounding yourself down to powder. Because I felt like I was being ground down to powder. You know what I mean? It's like, but somebody's got to get that. Somebody's got to pluck it, Mm. you know, or it's going to go bad. And so you think that the sowing is the hard part, but it's the reaping that actually is, right? And, Mm. And so as I, now I have two children, 
And because home is my favorite place, every job takes me away. Mm. And that's a really high cost to pay. The highest. Yeah. And so I've been thinking a lot about it. Mm. Um, And it is disappointing. Mm. Now, it's all divine and designed and necessary and all that stuff. You know, it's important for your children to see you operating in your calling. And I know that. And I know that I have my children for a reason. I know that I have my particular children for a reason. I know God knew what every, he knows it all. It's not that. It's, it's just, you know, the cost. Yeah. I'm, I'm over here, uh, holding back tears (sighs) because, um, a lot of people are not honest about the cost. And I'm at a place in my life where I just know too much now yeah, about motherhood and marriage and mm-hmm. what it requires. And also having been acting professionally since I was 14. Right. I know also what this requires. And what makes me emotional is I almost feel too conscious of Mm. whatever the cost will be as I start to add things into my life that have always been just as important as the career dreams. An old castmate of mine just said to me at a convention a couple of weeks ago, she said, you know, it's very interesting that as women, right at the time that, you know, you're really building your career is usually the same time that you're a young mother. Mm. And it's so interesting that that typically happens to a lot of women in this business. And so there is no such thing as balance. I remember reading a a quote from Shonda Rhimes that said that, that like, there's no such thing as balance. It's an illusion. Mm. And I've heard other mothers say that too. It's like, it's not about that because it's never going to be balanced. Like, that's not really how you think of it. It's like, you think of it in terms of priority and Mm -hmm. the moment, the present moment. I'm so grateful to Sonequa for the crucial reminder that there is no such thing as balance, at least not really. Instead, we must learn to practice setting boundaries I'm learning to protect my time and my energy by being more intentional about who and what I allow in my personal space. Setting boundaries is one of the ways I've learned to keep my cup filled. We cannot pour from an empty cup. Even though we give mothers credit for the amazing sacrifices they make, those sacrifices cannot come from an empty place. I think it's so beautiful that God created this reciprocal relationship between mother and child. While mothers are known to serve as comforters and nurturers, children have a special ability to be sources of joy and refuge. They often have the ability to protect us and help heal our wounds with just their presence. Kelly Rowland, four-time Grammy Award winner, actress, and my dear friend, also knows what it's like to mother while grieving the loss of a parent. Shortly after the birth of her son, Kelly also lost her mom. Her relationship with her mother was rocky, but becoming a parent gave her the strength to forgive. Everything changed in 2014. Yes. Come on, Titan. Come on, Titan. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about what you've, you've already privately, and I hope you're, you're open to sharing, but you've talked to me about yeah. that time in your life when the most amazing miracle happened. Mm-hmm. And then your mother passed away. Whew. Whew. Um, it's so crazy because with Titan, just with his name and knowing his name before he got here, I mm. knew he would be an unstoppable force. Um, and he taught me how to be a mother. Mm. Um, and I remember when um, I got the call 
to come to Atlanta because I needed to say my goodbyes to my mother. That's literally how it happened. Mm. And so I was like, okay. So I get there and it's all these machines and tubes and I have to make a final decision. And this is three weeks after I had my baby. (sighs) So being a mother and then taking a mother away, Mm. I never understood until... um, This past week, actually, Um, I I believe it was KRS-One. There's an artist named Kalita, and she posted KRS-One saying how he thinks that when death happens, like it's literally the ancestors coming to help you, like they, they come to help you. And I was like, oh, Well, that makes perfect sense because I feel like my mom, even though she's not physically here, Mm. she's even more incredible, heavenly. Because like whether it's like certain things like she might say to me or certain things, I'm like, oh, maybe I need to get up because he's da 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 Or he's sleeping or it's too cold. Like last night, it was too cold, but I'm warm under my blanket. But something was like, wake up. I woke up and on Noah's monitor thing, it said too cold. (gasps) Wow. So, yeah. Mm. So I cut the heat on because it Mm. was 30 some degrees last night here Mm. in LA. Yes, it was freezing. So it was freezing. So I was like, oh my gosh, like what a blessing. Granted, I could not go back to sleep and I couldn't figure that out, but it's all good. (laughs) But I just found it so amazing how that just happens. You know what I mean? Like, so I feel like, She's she's all around. She literally is all around. And same thing with Tim's father. Like Tim, I know he misses his dad, mm. um, but I always feel like his dad is is close by, for sure. Yeah. When my nana passed away in December of 2019, I remember being extremely sad, yeah. but also really angry. Mm. I felt like. She's, and I realized later that it was selfish, but the feelings were, she's not going to see me get married. She's not going to meet my Mm. children. She's not going to see my first home. She, all the things that have since happened, that have happened since she's passed. uh, I was angry. I was like, why? And I have an older sister. We're nine years apart, my Mm -hmm. sister Nakina. And in some ways I felt Mm -hmm. like, My nana had so much time with my nephew, Christopher, and got to see so many things that got to see my sister get married. I just wasn't going to have that experience. And then something clicked inside of me and I realized that there is a portal that I Mm -hmm. think God gives those of us who are still here Mm -hmm. to allow us to access our loved ones who then become our ancestor, you know, people are, you know, our people yes. who are now protecting us in a way yes. that they you cannot do in an earthly form. You cannot do in a Facts. human form. Facts. And once Facts. I tapped into that, I I one billion percent understand what you're saying. I feel like she's more present than she could have been when she was, Facts. you know, living at 90 years old with dementia. You know what I mean? Mm. It's a different type of thing. She comes to me and just as you were saying your mom does in ways that are so powerful. On my wedding day, I felt her. It is no Mm. doubt about it. It It's no doubt about it. I know that she blesses our home in a way that Mm -hmm. she could not do if she were just here as a human Mm -hmm. uh, in Mm -hmm. earthly flesh. You've been so transparent, you know, about the work you've done to forgive both your mother and your father. Um, so what do you teach your sons now about forgiveness? Whew. One, to forgive themselves mm. first. It seems to always be this thing to where I think that we're the hardest on ourselves. And... I remember I told you after Noah was born how Titan was acting out. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I was like, he hit me. <laughs> like, he, this boy actually hit me. Like, <laughs> you know, somebody probably would have been like, spank his ass, but I'm not that person. Yeah. I'm just not that person. I can't I can't do it. Um, and we've had this conversation. But 
I'm reading this book with Titan called Feel My Feelings. And there's one chapter in there um, about um, guilt, grief, and disappointment. Mm. And so we're reading about it in this book. Sorry, let me rewind. This book is all about, um, it's for kids. It's a book that teaches them about their emotions and helps them understand it and everything. It's a fantastic book. I literally recommend it for all parents. It's incredible. Even for adults. By the way, I've told this book to adults and they've gone out to buy it and they're like, this book has changed my life. Listen, I can do so, better at feeling my feelings as well. So I might have to go on ahead and get this book and read it to Diva, my dog. I'll read it to her. It, it's <laughs> exactly, but it's incredible. And um, so we're reading this book and in this one chapter it talks about uh, disappointment, guilt, and grief. And in when I say, when I read about guilt, he goes, oh, mommy, I know what guilt is. I said, do you? Hmm. He says, yes. I said, well, what what did you feel guilty about? He goes, remember that day that I hit you? And I said, yes. He said, oh, I felt really bad. Really, really. He goes on to say, really, I'm not over-exaggerating, 11 times. Which let me know that every time he said really, and the way he said really each time, it was a different kind of like emotion attached to it. Mm. And so I said, well, did you forgive yourself? He said, it took a while, a couple days, but I did. I said, okay, good. I said, because we talked and I forgave you. He said, yeah, but I still felt bad. I said, well, just know that when you apologized to me, I believed you. I said, you meant it, right? He said, of course I meant it. I said, okay. I said, I love you. I was like, but we should always make sure that we forgive ourselves. I was like, because... You know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. And the truth is, is that we have to forgive ourselves, make a decision to do better and move on. And I really want him to understand that mistakes will happen. You have to be honest with yourself when you look in the mirror and have the humility enough to say, I could have made a better decision. How do I make it better? That's it. That's wow. that's like really, really it. And I also show him that like, if I... Like there's this one morning, like I was just like, I woke up too late and I'm moving too fast. You know what I mean? And I raised my voice and I shouldn't have raised my voice. And I said, Titan, I apologize. He has to see humility. Like, you know what I mean? Me be like filled with humility as well. And and an example and apologize and be okay with that and let him know adults make mistakes too. You know what I mean? So I, I wasn't raised in that type of household. You know what I mean? And I wanted to do something different with my kids, period. Mm. Yeah, we're all trying to break, hopefully, break generational curses, right? Yes. Uh, Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, we want our children to be better than us. That's that To me, that's the goal of legacy. That's what it's all about. People often say that their children teach them something about themselves, right? It highlights something about who they are. So what do Titan and Noah teach you about Kelly? Whew. Man, you're great at these questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I had kids, I didn't think I was patient or I could be patient. So they, they taught me that I have patience. But above anything, I have to be patient with myself. Oh. It's true. Uh, I don't know what we feel like we're in a hurry for. We're not going to know everything or learn everything. For me, I was like, well, I'm a mother and I have to know this and I have to know that. No, you don't. You don't know crap about being a mom. You don't know crap about this incredible being that's coming into your life, that's forming their own pathway, that's going to challenge you in ways you never thought. And you have to allow them to space to carve out for themselves to be that being. Because Mm -hmm. we don't know what we have next. We don't know if they're curing cancer. We don't know if they're saving the world. We don't know if they're um, being an amazing example in another child's life. We don't know if they're a teacher. We don't know what kind of way they're going to affect the world in a positive way. We are supposed to be here to help them along the way and teach them and try not to screw it up. That's literally, literally the goal is you just like, okay, 
how how do I how am I patient in this moment that he's screaming and I don't know what to do but this is what my mom would do but that didn't feel right for me as a kid mm. so let me try a different approach that's what you're thinking as a, I know that's what I think as a parent mm. The beauty of motherhood is so closely connected to nature Children come to us in the form of seeds We water them with our love and watch them grow These delicate plants that come without instructions, we learn how to love them and loving them changes us for the better. Loving them makes us stronger in the same way that being well-loved also gives them strength. I look forward to meeting my little ones someday, to meeting the humans they will become. I also look forward to meeting the woman they will help me become. We talk a lot about home here on Trials to Triumphs, our origin, our roots, Poet Naira Wahid said it best in her poem, Lands. Our mothers were our first country, the first place we ever lived. Everything starts and ends with our mothers. Even if we have a difficult relationship with our moms, they are always a part of who we are. They raise us up, and part of their roots remain in us always. We are as much their legacy as they are ours. Today, I celebrate the women who have made us who we are and the children who have made all women mothers. So to our first country, thank you for enduring the pain and the grief. Thank you for embracing the joy and the grace. Thank you for being you. We see you, we thank you, we love you, and we honor you. Thank you for being everything you've been to us. And thank you for listening. You can find the full episodes for Asia Naomi King, Sonequa Martin-Green, and Kelly Rowland in our podcast feed. Subscribe to Trials to Triumphs wherever you listen to your favorite shows. After the credits, I'm sharing a famous mother whose sacrifice transformed lives for generations to come. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lentigua. This episode was mixed by Kojin Tashiro. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Michelle Baker and Shanice Tyndall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you did, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcast to ensure you hear the next one. Since this episode featured gems from previous episodes, I wanted to also offer something fresh. This week, I'm answering my own history-related question. Are you ready? What famous mom from history do I find inspiring? Coretta Scott King. While grieving her late husband, Coretta chose not to retreat in her grief, but instead used it to fuel her husband's dreams to create a better future. Less than three months after Martin Luther King Jr.'s death, Coretta founded the King Center, an organization that teaches nonviolent philosophy in memory of the late civil rights leader. In the words of her daughter, Bernice King, Coretta is the architect of the King legacy, and without her work, there would be no MLK Day. Coretta's courageous choice not only transformed life for her own children, but the lives of many generations that followed. Miss Coretta, we are so grateful to you and your sacrifice. <laughs>